What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and I got to be honest with you guys. I can usually bang out these must-start videos by lunchtime, noonish. Today, I didn't finish until like 6, 6.30 because I couldn't stop watching these World Cup games. I was trying to get work done. I had it on a separate monitor, and it was just tough. Both games went into extra time. Both games went into penalties, so they both took a long time. Both great games. I know you guys probably don't even really watch soccer if you're watching fantasy football content, but just want to let you guys know. World Cup, it is electric. Now, today, we're going to talk through five must-start players. These are my five best plays of the week. What I do here is I look at my rankings from the Patreon, I compare them to Fantasy Pro's expert consensus rankings, and then I give you guys players who I am higher on than consensus. Today we have five. Let's not waste any time. We already talked some World Cup here, so I know that you guys want me to get it moving here. So, as always, if you enjoy, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like. Let's go. Thirsty, thirsty, trying to choose. I mean, I know I'm critical. All right, now first up here, we have Joe Mixon. And I know this one is pretty obvious. We have five players. We're going to get deeper and deeper as we go. But I just want to give you guys the confidence to start Joe Mixon after like back-to-back -back weeks of not playing and Samaj P. Ryan looking really good and maybe even having some buzz that he can take on a larger role. I want to let you guys know, Joe Mixon is my RB7 he is consensus RB11, so I have him four spots higher than consensus here. He's going to be at home against Cleveland, and really what it comes down to is Mixon's health and whether or not he splits time with Samaj P. Ryan. And I'll admit, Mixon is coming out of concussion protocol, so it's pretty ballsy to play players fresh off of concussion protocol. You had Juju Smith-Schuster a few weeks ago. He came off of concussion protocol, played in the game, and was just a decoy, didn't play a full share of snaps. Now... He was cleared the Saturday before. I believe Mixon was cleared sometime midweek. This has been a multiple week thing for him. It feels like that, you know, they've been super cautious with this. And he should be back in here playing as the lead back. I don't think it's going to be some kind of 50-50 split. I don't really see P. Ryan being a massive factor in a divisional game against Cleveland here. Bengals are still in the mix to win their division. And what I mean by that is they're, they're not runaway favorites to win the division. Now, you have Tyler Huntley in there. I believe that they're behind the Ravens right now, but it's a meaningful game. They're playing for home field advantage. They need to win the division, and they need to beat the Browns. So I'm expecting like a 65-35 split, which is about what it's been all season between Mixon and Samaj P. Ryan. And even if it's skewed a little bit more towards P. Ryan than we'd like, this is still a home game versus the Cleveland Browns, who are allowing the most adjusted fantasy points per game Two opposing running backs that have just been awful against the run all year long. So I like Mixon here. I think he can have like 15 plus touches, score a touchdown, and be a nice mid-range RB1 in a week where it feels like everybody is on by. After that, we have Chris Godwin here, who is my wide receiver 14. He's consensus is wide receiver 18. And I think people hate this matchup, and it's probably for good reason. You have Chris Godwin going across the country to San Francisco playing in San Fran. I believe that they're underdogs and it's a really low over-under. I think the over-under is like around like 36, one of the lowest of the slate. And this has been a defense that is playing out of their mind recently. They are the best EPA per play defense in the country over the last four weeks. Now, EPA per play is just a defensive efficiency, or it's just an efficiency stat. But when we do EPA per play allowed on defense, that becomes a defensive efficiency stat. Now, EPA, and I explain this every video. Let me know if it's getting redundant, but I think that there's a lot of people out there that don't really know what EPA is or how it works. And EPA stands for expected points added, which is a measure of how well a team performs relative to expectation. For example, if a team starts a drive on the 50 yard line, it's expected to point, it's expected points to start the drive would be about 2.5. If the team ends the drive with a field goal, thus gaining three points, it's EPA for that drive would be found by subtracting its ex expected points from how many points it actually gained. 3 minus 2.5 or 0 0.5 EPA. I don't know why I was absolutely stumbling over that, but essentially how many points are you expected to uh, score on a given drive? How much are you performing above and below that? The 49ers in a situational basis in terms of just like, okay, it's first and 10. They are allowing the least amount of expected points added. Um, so on a per play basis, their opponents are performing below what they're expected. And 
that's going to be rough for this Bucks offense that hasn't been able to get it going. They just struggled to score any points against the Saints defense. They also have an implied team total by Vegas of 16.75 points, the third lowest team total of the slate behind just the Jets and the Texans. So if they shouldn't score a ton and they're playing against a great defense, why do I think that Chris Godwin's such a great play this week? And I think when we look at the San Francisco defense, their run defense is actually better than their pass defense. If we look at just their pass defense in their last four games, they are allowing the least amount of rush yards, but they are allowing the 12th most passing yards to opposing defenses. They've also allowed the 15th most adjusted fantasy points to wide receivers on the season. So I would say run defense is elite. Of course, the defensive line is elite. Their DBs aren't anything crazy. Their pass defense isn't that great. So I think it's a defense where their soft spot is going to be in coverage. And we look at Godwin. Godwin's one of my favorite guys to target in these videos because you can sort of dial in on the slot corner matchup. Godwin plays about three, quarter, three quarters of his snaps in the slot, which means he's going to get the slot corner, the nickel corner, all game long. And he gets a matchup versus Jimmy Ward. Now, Jimmy Ward plays safety, but, you know, when they go into, like, nickel packages and stuff, he's going to come up and they'll probably replace him. So I know they have Hufanga back there. I don't know who else they have. He plays in the slot a lot of the time. And I found 70 corners who had 200 or more coverage snaps and 100 or more of those snaps aligned up in the slot. And when we look at their fantasy points allowed per snap, Jimmy Ward is allowing the second most fantasy points per snap. Now, I will say you also have their coverage grade, right? So he's at 66.4. He's not nearly as bad as, you know, Kyler Gordon and Charles Chris Harris, but he is allowing a lot of yards, catches, fantasy points when he's in coverage. So you have a guy here. Now, he also has that 66.4 coverage grade, which I said is like, it's decent. It's not the best. It's like, the, it's 29th of 70. So he's about average in terms of coverage grade. He's allowing the second most fantasy points per coverage snap here and he is going to be lined up against Chris Godwin for most of the game so we have a pass defense that isn't as good as advertised and even though the Bucks aren't projected to score a ton of points Godwin is going to be a PPR machine going up against one of their worst coverage corners on the 49ers in a negative game script on the road they're going to have to throw the ball a ton I want to say Brady's up there as like a top three top five guy in most pass attempts this year they're going to pass the ball a ton and in his nine games since returning in week four, Chris Godwin has only had two games under 10 targets. Seven of nine of his games since returning in week four have been 10 or more targets. I think he's going to be a PPR machine here. I can't guarantee he scores a touchdown, but I think like 10 targets, eight catches and like 80 yards sounds about right for Godwin. Now on the other side of that game, we're going back to the well here. I know he was on this list last time. He was actually on the thumbnail last week and he only gave you guys 12 points. And me 12 points. I have Debo in a lot of spots. But I'm going back to the well. If I have Debo, I'm starting Debo. I have him as my wide receiver 24. He's consensus as wide receiver 27. I have him three spots higher than consensus. I'm tempted to move him even higher than wide receiver 24. That was when I did the rankings on Thursday. And it was sort of up in the air whether or not he was going to play or if he was going to be limited. And people are scared off of Debo because of the injury and because of Brock Purdy. And I think if you are in a game this week, all of us have the fantasy playoffs on the, on the line. If you have Debo on your team, and I mean, if you have like studs across the board, let's say you have like Waddle, Godwin, T. Higgins as like your three wide receivers, like two wide receivers and a flex, don't start Debo. But if you're thinking between like Debo and a Jacoby Myers or like Debo, Packers are on bias, so that's a bad example. But you know, like Debo and those like fringe guys, like Debo versus Josh Palmer, I would go Debo personally, or like Debo versus, you know, any of those guys in that like wide receiver 25 to 35 area. Give me Debo if you need to win your week this week. I'm tempted to just live and die by Debo. Now, when we talk about the matchup here, the reason I like Debo is because, first of all, he was taken off of the injury report. He was removed from the Week 14 injury report. Uh, he will play against the Bucks, and pretty much he's been dealing with this quad injury that's sort of had him limited the last couple of weeks. It sounds like he is finally all healed up, ready to go here. So he is confirmed going to play on Sunday. He is also confirmed no longer on the injury report. He should be good to go. And I know that Brock Purdy is technically a... a step down at quarterback from Jimmy G. And that's 100% true. But Brock Purdy is kind of good for Debo Samuel's archetype. If we look at sort of the archetypes here, I put together week 13 targets. I took out the uh, Jimmy G targets. Jimmy G had four targets before Brock Purdy came in. Brock Purdy had 37 targets in week 13, or he had 37 attempts, but I just put it under targets. 
Debo had 10 targets, McCaffrey had nine, Ayuk had seven, Kittle had two. And if we look at their ADOTs matchup, Brock Purdy on the entire year, his ADOT has been 6.4, which is really low. 6.4 is the second lowest among 47 qualified quarterbacks. He is a check down, you know, dump it into the flats artist. And that's probably how they're going to sort of run this offense with Brock Purdy at QB. And once Jimmy G left, Debo Samuel led the entire team in targets. He had 10 targets. I think him and Christian McCaffrey as the two lowest ADOT guys of this main four, they're going to get peppered with targets, with carries, with touches, all of that good stuff. So you have a spot here where Debo's ADOT is really good for Brock Purdy. And he is going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who are allowing the second highest target share to opposing wide receivers. They're allowing the 12th most adjusted fantasy points to wide receivers. And I think that he is a really good bet to see about 10 touches, whether that's targets, carries. And once we get into the wide receiver 20s area, give me Debo Samuel with 10 touches. Give me a spike week. I will live and die by Debo Samuel. Now, our fourth player is going to be Raheem Mostert here. And it seems like a lot of people are almost tempted to like, I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to say, I don't want to be caught jumping the gun here, but I'm surprised that S for Consensus Rankings has Jeff Wilson ahead of Raheem Mostert after we saw last week. I have Raheem Mostert as my RB22 this week. Consensus has him as RB28, so I'm six spots higher than Consensus here. And again, it's almost like people didn't watch last week. Like if we look here, Mostert played 60% of the snaps. He was the clear lead back here. I believe that he took the first snap of the game, but I could be wrong. This is a guy who has not seen the field since week 10. He comes in last week and immediately takes over the backfield. He handles 7 of 10 opportunities, which is a 70% opportunity share, 60% of the snaps. And since Raheem Mostert leaving, Jeff Wilson hasn't been that great. He's been at about 3 yards per carry. He had a dropped pass last game that McDaniel didn't seem to love. And if McDaniel's going to play the hot hand, the hot hand at this current moment is Raheem Mostert. And when we have Raheem Mostert here, as what I would say, like the lead back, like a 55 45 or like 60 40 split here, you have a Chargers defense who are allowing the fifth most adjusted fantasy points to running backs. And in a matchup here where Vegas has the Dolphins projected for 27.25 points this week, which is, I believe, the second most in the NFL, tied for the second most in the NFL, or at least like in the top four. So there should be plenty of TDs to go around. They're playing as a soft run defense. I also don't hate Jeff Wilson this week. I also have Jeff Wilson inside my top 30 running backs. I just think that the they should probably be swapped. I think both are startable. Raheem Mostert would be my preferred start in this matchup. Now, our last one here. It's a guy who might be on your waiver wire, depending on what kind of league you're in. And we're going to talk about a tight end, Dawson Knox here. And Dawson Knox is going to be at home against my New York Jets. His rank is the tight end 11 in my rankings. He's a tight end 14 in consensus. I have him three spots higher than consensus. And this is a little bit more narrative-y than I, than I would like to admit. But Dawson Knox, this just feels like a Dawson Knox game. He's going to be at home versus a divisional opponent in the Jets. And when we look at the home road splits with Dawson Knox this year, in four games at home, he's averaging 10.2 points per game. On the road, 5.27 points per game. 10.2 points per game is like a top six, top eight tight end this year. That's how bad the position has been. And the Bills are still expected to score against a great defense in the Jets. They have the fourth highest team total at 26.5. Touchdowns will be scored. And I think this is going to be a spot here where, again, this is my Jets team. I love to see the Jets win, but we're going back to their place after we beat them in pretty brutal fashion at our spot. They're going to want it, you know, they're going to want it just, they just want to probably kill us, man. They, they want to go down there, murder the Jets, blow them out. Like They're going to want to score as many touchdowns as possible. They probably did not love losing to the Jets the first time. This is a game that is sort of a statement game for them, and it's going to be rough. Now, coincidentally, if you're going to beat the Jets in the passing game, it's going to be through the tight end spot. And if we look here, this is from J.J. Zacharyson's adjusted points allowed within like his data dump thing. Uh, it's on his website. It's really, really cool. The Jets are allowing the 29th most adjusted fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks, the 32nd most to wide receivers, so the best against wide receivers. Gabe Davis was locked up last time. Stephon Diggs did produce well, but Stephon Diggs is always going to get going to get his. I don't think Gabe Davis is a great play this week. But when we look at tight end, they're about middle of the road, 15th. 
we don't have great coverage. Like we don't have anybody that's great at coverage in the middle of the field. It's like Quan Alexander, CJ Mosley to, I mean, Quan Alexander is pretty mobile, but CJ Mosley is just strictly a run stopper. Uh, Isaiah Whitehead has just been absolutely awful in coverage. Same thing with LaMarcus Joyner back there. So there's holes. I could easily see one of those like pop passes in the goal line formation where, you know, Josh does like a, a fake QB draw, passes over the top to Dawson Knox. It just feels like one of those not Dawson Knox touchdowns are going to get scored this week. I think that he's probably in play here for like four catches, 50 yards, and a touchdown. That's probably what I would expect from Dawson Knox. Now, that is going to do it for us today. As always, if you want access to the complete week 14 rankings, that will be on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. I will update that Sunday morning to make sure that we're all good to go for injuries, any late news, any late game inactives, all of that good stuff. Now, if you enjoyed, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like, and I will see you guys in the next one. I got the juice, I got the juice. Ten oaks, Adam's on. Foolies, glad I'm on. Even my haters kind of glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag up on. Rapper, song, singer, suspended subpoena from Mr. Meaner.